We're here at the Conference on Truth and Deception at the German American Institute in Heidelberg, Germany with Brett Schaefer from the German Marshall Fund. You are the Social Media Analyst and Communications Officer right. Right, for the Alliance for Securing Democracy. Yeah. Lovely. Well, so our issue here is, of course, like I said, truth and deception. In a nutshell, why is the topic of disinformation so serious and so grave at this moment? Well, I think we saw after the 2016 U.S. presidential election mm -hmm. that disinformation possibly could have real consequences. We've seen efforts, obviously, during the French elections. Uh, we've seen disinfo campaigns in Ukraine and the Baltics. So we're seeing this now not become sort of a localized problem, uh, really spreading globally in almost every election. And then broader than elections, we're seeing this have real impacts on societies in general. So taking the fissures that actually exist there on their own, but really amplifying them. So you're having communities who are fighting against each other. Mm -hmm. You're having really inauthentic conversations online. Mm -hmm. So it's become very difficult to have a constructive policy or social debate. Or any sort of civil discourse in a sense. Yeah. Right. Okay. Civil discourse is <clears throat> broken down. Yeah. So, and one of the one of the missions of the Alliance for Securing Democracy is sort of countering authoritarian interference in democracies. So how does your institution actually pursue this goal? Could you maybe just explain a little bit the work that you guys do? Right, so we look at it across several different tracks. So disinformation is one of them, but we also look at things like malign finance, so mm -hmm. dirty money. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at things like support for extremist parties. So we're trying to look at the entire toolkit that authoritarian governments use to put pressure on democracies. So sometimes, obviously, that is stirring up tensions within communities, within countries. Other times, it's actually directly supporting some extremist parties. And then, of course, there's a the problem of dirty money and energy politics and all the different pressure points that authoritarian governments can use uh, to really swing um, the course of democracy in general, but particularly how um, democracies work within countries. So by really ramping up support for the parties that are trying to undermine, for example, the EU or transatlantic relationships, uh, there's really an effort to sort of divide the West in general. So what efforts are the US, is the U.S. government uh, undertaking actually to counteract these kinds of things? Is it enough or where are we falling short? I think there's a sense by a lot of uh, uh, citizens that maybe we're not doing enough. Yeah, I mean, government is always a bit slow to respond, I think, mm -hmm. because it takes a while first for the issue to really raise to the level that it's being discussed at the highest policy levels, and then it takes time for... Uh, new laws, new sort of precedents to be set. So we're behind the curve, certainly. I mean, we know that there was interference in the 2016 election. We're almost at the 2018 election, and very little has been done, actually, to fix the vulnerabilities that we saw in 2016. That said, there have been some efforts to deal with the impact, for example, of money laundering mm -hmm. in Europe, uh, as well as the U.S. So there have been increased sanctions. Um, the cost of some of these bad actions has certainly risen. Uh, you know, we've seen recently GRU members in Russia who have been publicly exposed. There's certainly more of a light being shown on some mm -hmm. of this activity, which obviously helps. And, I'm, and also looking at the tech companies. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to 2015, 2014, it was just sort of the Wild West online, and nobody was paying attention to how data was being shared. So now we've seen the tech companies brought before Congress several different times. While there's been no real legislation in the U.S., that was going to be my yeah. question. Like, there's certainly what was the actual pressure. consequence. Yeah. So the, the, I think the the consequence <laughs> is if you hold their feet to the fire mm -hmm. by dragging them from the Congress, that has inspired them to police themselves a bit more. Which doesn't mean that there mm -hmm. aren't still major problems, but at least now they know that they can't get away with what they were able to get away with three years ago because nobody was looking and nobody was paying attention. So just by having to sit there and answer questions, even though Congress has done really nothing to this mm -hmm. point to actually regulate, I think that exposure and that pressure has actually moved the ball a bit down the field because they understand if they don't start correcting some of these issues, uh, Congress is going to be forced to regulate. Um, switching gears for a little bit, so you're also the primary analyst for something called the Hamilton 68 dashboard. Right. Um, for our viewers at home, maybe you can explain what that is and what you do and what sort of what this tool is effective for. Yeah, so this is a project we launched in August of last year. So it looks okay. at 600 Russian-linked accounts on Twitter. 
we use the word Russian linked, it doesn't mean they're actually operated in Russia or mm -hmm. operated by the Russian government. Now mm -hmm. we have a high degree of confidence that some of them are. So we look at that core network and we look at the main amplifiers of Russian media messages, for example. So who are the people spreading the narratives that are consistent with these accounts that are hyperactive that we think are connected to the Russian government, as well as things like RT and Sputnik. So this gives us a sense of an entire network and what they're talking about on a daily basis. So the Hamilton 68 dashboard will show in real time the hashtags they're using, the topics they're talking about, the URLs that they're linking to, to give a sense of where the focus is for these kind of Russian disinfo efforts at any given mm -hmm. time. And then in theory, uh, giving us this sort of knowledge to counteract those messages. And we also had, we had a similar project in Germany around the elections last mm -hmm. year called Article 38, did the same thing with German Twitter. So what constitutes, what, what like bar needs to be sort of reached in order to classify something as Russian linked? What does that exactly denote? So the core of our network was really found through human intelligence. So we had a team of outside researchers, including former FBI agents, who were able to track some of these accounts over several years, particularly looking at their activity in Syria and around that conversation. So they were able to reach a high degree of confidence after looking at the behavioral patterns of some of these core accounts that they knew where this was coming from. So they're sort of able to connect it back to Russia quite conclusively. The accounts around it, we're able to do sort of network analysis. So we don't know exactly who's at the keyboard, but we know how they're acting and who they're interacting with. So these are the accounts that we know are amplifying these messages at a high volume. So what we don't want to see are just the people who retweet an RT story a couple times. These sure. are the main sort of drivers and amplifiers of narratives. So if you look at these accounts, mm -hmm. they're tweeting hundreds of times a day often. Mm -hmm. I mean, our network of 600 typically tweets 20,000 times a day. So these are hyperactive <laughs> so accounts. So do I. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> okay, so they're, they're, they're actually necessarily all also probably fake accounts, so they're not necessarily like run by an individual or Correct. representing an individual. Correct. Okay. Some, maybe. Most of them, we think, are probably using sock puppet identities. So okay. many are portraying themselves as Midwestern Americans. We've kind of looked at their patterns of behavior and found mm. that to be highly unlikely. This may be not so weird, but so when we're speaking of the responsibility being laid at the door for social media companies, like Twitter in this instance, wouldn't it be feasible to sort of just find, you know, Twitter bots? Like, it can't, it can't be that difficult, can it? Like, as a non-tech person myself, I'm trying to wrap my head around, like, how, how actually difficult it would be to just say, like, you know, if someone's tweeting 20,000 times a day, like, clearly can't be reasonable. Right. So therefore, it would have to be, like, an automated account, and those could just easily be banned. The automated accounts are pretty easy to find. And Twitter has gotten better at taking those down. Okay. So for a while, I don't think they really had any incentive to take down bots because mm -hmm. it just made them seem like they had more users. And of course, having more users is better for selling ads. Sure. Now that there's been pressure, we're seeing them taking down millions of accounts a month. And for them to ID an automated account is pretty easy. Mm -hmm. What is challenging <clears throat> are the sort of professional trolls yeah. that are tweeting at a high volume, not thousands of times a day, but 50 to 100 times a day, occasionally use some level of automation. So we call mm -hmm. them cyborg accounts. So there's somebody sitting there, they type some messages, but they also use a little bit of automation just mm -hmm. to keep things kind of running full time. So those kind of accounts are a little bit more difficult because okay. they're going to show different patterns of behavior that machine learning wouldn't catch immediately. So you've spoken a little bit about how government might possibly uh, counteract disinformation campaigns. Me, as an individual, or any other, let's say in this, in this context now, any German citizen or U.S. citizen, what can one do uh, if one wants to help out? So I think there is a great deal of responsibility that actually falls on the individual mm -hmm. because if real users weren't engaging with these accounts and spreading some of these messages within their own sort of organic online communities, whether mm -hmm. online or offline, this wouldn't really have an impact. If the bots and trolls were just talking to each other and tweeting at each other, it doesn't matter. So I think the individual needs to look at what they're doing online more critically. So when they see a story, whether they want to believe it's true or not, and that's the thing. Most of the time, people are spreading fake news stories that they want to believe are true. Because if you're a Trump supporter and it's something about Clinton, you spend less time wanting to really check the facts. But I think it is incumbent 
on social media users to actually do that fact checking before they retweet it. Because once you, as a real user, retweet something, email it to relatives, you then become the source of that information. So the next user down the line loses that context where it originally came from. So they're not able to say, this story doesn't seem right, this outlet I've never heard of. Now this story is coming from you. You might be a brother, a friend. So you've given it credibility. So I think that's the role of the user, is just to be a critical thinker online. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Brett Schaefer. It was a pleasure having you. Appreciate it. (laughs) Thank you.